Good morning. I'm so excited to be with you guys today as we get to dive into God's Word and finish up this series in Jonah. We'll be going through the fourth chapter, and I'm excited to see what God has for us. In case we don't know each other, I would just like to tell you a few little things about myself. I am Ruth, as Tim said, and my husband Kyle and I have been married for 14 years. That's my family up there. We have two kids. We have Parker, who's 10, and Eliza, who is 8. And we have been attending COV for about two years now. And we're very grateful that God has brought us to this community. We feel truly blessed that each member of our family is thriving here and are very grateful for what God's doing at COV. I love teaching God's Word. I do. I really love it. I love the study aspect of it. I love what God teaches me as I prepare to teach. It is truly such an incredible blessing as a teacher of God's Word. The lessons that you learn in the midst of preparation is an indescribable blessing and something that I do not take for granted. Now, I also love a really good cup of coffee. I love the mountains. I love adventures with my family. I love ice cream, really any dessert, honestly. And one of my most favorite things is hosting any kind of party at my house. So before we get into our text today, I want us to do a little review. Repetition is important. It helps us remember. It helps us also not forget what we've been learning from the past. And also, if you've missed a week or two, you're going to be all caught up with us. So we're in the book of Jonah, as we've been seeing, and so far the story has gone a little bit like this. The prophet Jonah was given a word from the Lord to go to Nineveh. The Lord tells Jonah to preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. That's what the Lord told Jonah. So what does Jonah do? He flees, and he boards a ship and heads in the completely opposite direction. God calls him to go one way, and Jonah goes literally the completely opposite way. Then a great storm arises up. And the sailors that Jonah is with on this ship find him asleep at the bottom of the ship. They cast lots to find out who is to blame for the violent storm. And the lot falls on Jonah. He tells the sailors to throw him overboard. They try and do everything within their power to prevent doing so. But when their efforts fail, they throw him into the sea. Then God provides a great fish to swallow Jonah. And while in the belly of the fish, which I think is the ultimate thinking place, Jonah cries out to the Lord, recognizing his need for God's grace and says, What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. Now finally, after three days, the Lord commands the fish to spit Jonah out onto dry land. The the word of the Lord comes to Jonah again, a second time, to go to Nineveh. And this time, Jonah listens. He goes to the city and proclaims that the Lord will destroy it in 40 days if the people do not turn from their wicked ways. And there is an incredible, unprecedented response from the people of Nineveh. A fast is proclaimed, and the people repent from their evil ways, changing how they live. Now when God saw the people's response to his words through Jonah, he did not bring about the destruction that Jonah had warned them of, just like we read in that verse in chapter 3. So this is where we pick up the story this morning. Jonah has just preached to an enemy city, told them they would be destroyed if they did not turn from their evil ways, and he has had the most incredible response ever because they all responded. He has just preached the most response-inducing message of his life. And what is Jonah doing? He's sulking and he's mad. We're going to open up our Bibles and look in Jonah chapter 4. So if you're already there, just go on to the next chapter. We're going to start in chapter 4, verse 1. The text will be on the screen, and I'm going to give you a second to turn there, and then we'll start reading. Jonah 1, 3. But to Jonah, this seemed 
or 4-1. Did I say 1-3? I'm sorry. 4-1. Thank you. Okay, 4-1. Don't want to confuse you. Okay, here we go. But Jonah, th- to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That it uh, That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah is mad. He's basically telling God, I told you so. Jonah had been forgiven by God, and yet he could not see that Nineveh had received the same forgiveness They were both equal before the Lord. Sin is sin to God. We all stand equal at the cross. All people, because we are all sinful, are in need of a Savior. And we are saved by by grace because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, in the verses that we just read, Jonah is quoting Exodus 34, specifically in verse 2. But the problem is, is that he is leaving out an important part of Exodus 34. So we're going to read that in just a second. It'll be up on the screen, but if you want to turn there, you can start looking now. And in Exodus 34, Moses is up on Mount Sinai. He has just asked to see the glory of the Lord, and the Lord has told him that he will only allow Moses to see his back. Because the Lord told Moses, for no one may see me and live. So let's read Exodus 34, starting in verse 4, and we're going to go through 7a. It'll be up on the screen, and this is what it says. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. He carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Do you see what's missing from Jonah's prayer? It's verse 7, what we just read. That was missing. The part that talks about how even though God forgives wickedness, rebellion, and sin, he will also not leave the guilty unpunished. Jonah forgets about his own rebellion and sin. He needed God's grace just as much as the people of Nineveh. Now, the Assyrians did not deserve God's forgiveness, but neither do we. That's grace. Undeserved favor. That's what grace is. So let's review what Nineveh was guilty of, just to give us a little bit of perspective. They were guilty of evil plots against God, exploitation of the helpless, cruelty and war, idolatry, prostitution, and witchcraft. So let's, as we're thinking of those things, pause for a moment and think about what it must have been like to witness such a great response to truth that the Ninevites had. Jonah saw an entire city turn from their sinful ways. That's incredible. And what is Jonah's response? He responded with selfishness and judgment. He didn't want the people to experience God's incredible forgiveness. Now, we may not directly say, I don't want, fill in the blank with whomever you think, to experience God's redemption and God's grace. But do our actions say this? Do we have a passion to bring the gospel to all people? Because our lack of urgency can be just as bad as Jonah's running away. This feels like the ultimate toddler tantrum in Target. Okay? I want you to say that ten times fast. 
You, you know what I mean. Even if you're not a parent, you've seen it, right? The like, I want this, or it's not fair, and you're so mean, or don't grab my arm, that hurts. That one's the worst, right? But our God is so gracious, and he is so patient, and he responds with this one simple question in verse 4. We're going to go back to Jonah 4, 4. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? The Lord calls Jonah out for his anger, and there's no reply from Jonah. We're going to read verse 5 in just a second. And instead, we're going to see him setting up camp, waiting to see what really happens to the city of Nineveh. Verse 5. But Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. How quickly Jonah had forgotten God's mercy and forgiveness. And plus, how dramatic and whiny is he, right? God was so gentle to tenderly teach Jonah a lesson about his grace and his compassion. The Lord sent a giant fish to swallow Jonah up, to give him time to think and to pray and to ask for forgiveness. And God's miraculous saving of Jonah's life seems to be old news at this point. And he is setting up his temporary shelter outside of the city. And we see a little bit deeper into his heart. Because Jonah is just waiting to see if the city is going to be destroyed or not. And it seems like he's hoping that God would maybe just possibly change his mind and not be so gracious. Jonah is completely focused on what he thinks is best and what he thinks the best thing for God to do is. And he misses the gracious love of our Heavenly Father who desires to see all types of people saved. Are we more focused on our own interests than on the spiritual state of our friends and our neighbors? Do we pray for the lost? Even the ones that are really, really hard to love. I'm sure you can think of a few people in your life like that. But let's not be like Jonah. Not setting up a camp just waiting to see if someone will be destroyed. Let's pick back up in verse 6 and continue with our story. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. A little shift in perspective for Jonah, huh? Again, we see God's grace and his compassion for Jonah. The Lord provided a plant to shelter him from the heat. And how does he respond? He is very happy about the plant. Now, in the ESV, it says that he is exceedingly glad Something has gone right. Something has gone Jonah's way. And now he's happy. And everything feels right in the world at this moment. How often do we respond to God in the same cycle as Jonah? We feel a call. We know that we have something that we are supposed to do. And we don't only not listen, we run. And then after God has been gracious with us and he's convicted our hearts of our disobedience, we finally listen. But then we complain when things don't turn out like we think they should. And we get mad and we sulk and we feel sorry for ourselves. And then maybe something goes a little bit more our way, right? And we're happy all of a sudden. Our plant has come. And then finally when things turn sour again, we respond out of anger and frustration, just like we're going to see in verse 7 next. Let's continue in our text. Verse 7, But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant, and it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. We see God's control over the forces of nature once again. And just as he controlled the sea, 
and the great fish. He divinely provided a plant to shelter Jonah, and then he provided a worm to chew it up. The Lord also provided a scorching east wind and a blazing sun that caused Jonah to feel faint. It could have easily been 120 degrees in the sun where he was at this point. And what's Jonah's response to the Lord? It would be better for me to die than to live. And again, we see God's gracious response with one simple question in verse 9. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I am so angry, I wish I were dead. Jonah is mad. And this time he answers the Lord by saying, yes, yes, my anger is warranted. And I wish that I were dead. That's pretty bold. That's a strong statement. But Jonah is blind to the reality of God's grace. He is more upset about a plant than the fact that more than 100,000 people could have been destroyed. Now it's easy as the readers of this story to see Jonah's disobedience, his lack of compassion, and his complaining. But remember that cycle we just talked about? Where are you caught up in the same response cycle as Jonah? Let's continue on and hear the end of our story. Verse 10. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and so many animals? The Lord is contrasting Jonah's concern for this plant to his own concern for the city of Nineveh. And he's pointing out the fact that Jonah had nothing to do with the plant, right? It tells us in the text. He didn't tend it. He didn't make it grow. It was a gift of mercy from the Lord. And God's mercy is his to give. It is never up to us. Are we so focused on our own comfort, our own plant, that we miss the opportunity to share the gospel. We see once again God's control over nature. He is the giver of life and he is in complete and total control of all things. He can teach us lessons by giving and by taking away. And ultimately he knows what is best for us. The sin of Nineveh grieved God's heart. Do we have that kind of love for the lost? For people who look or live differently than we do? And I would also ask, are we grieved over our own sin? Sin that can sneak in and can build up a wall around our heart. We have to constantly be checking our hearts, asking for forgiveness and repenting from our sinful ways. In his book, The Prodigal Prophet, Tim Keller had this great quote that I'm going to read for you. It'll be up on the screen so you can follow along with me. Uh, But it was very convicting, and I, I would like to share it with you. There are many people who have no idea what they should be living for or the meaning of their lives, nor have they any guide to tell them right from wrong. God looks down at people in that kind of spiritual fog, that spiritual stupidity, and he doesn't say, you idiots. When we look at people who have brought trouble upon or into their lives by their own foolishness, we say things like, serves them right. Or we mock them on social media. What kind of an imbecile says something like this? When we see people of the other political party defeated, we just gloat. This is all a way of detaching ourselves from them. We distance ourselves from them partially out of pride and partially because we don't want their unhappiness to be ours. God doesn't do that. Real compassion, 
The voluntary attachment of our hearts to others means the sadness of their condition makes us sad. It affects us. That is deeply uncomfortable, but it is the character of compassion. Are we reflecting the true character of compassion? Are we voluntarily attaching ourselves to others and walking with them through the most difficult seasons of life? That's hard, but that is compassion. Do we have true compassion? Compassion like Jesus had. Like Jesus, who even on the cross, in deep physical agony, as he hung nailed to wood, cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus isn't saying that the people who are killing him are free of wrongdoing. But he is saying that because they are guilty of wrongdoing, they in turn need forgiveness. They need forgiveness from their their sins, the very thing that Jesus was sent to do. Jesus was sent to take on our sin and die in our place. And even in the very act of taking on the sins of the world, Jesus had compassion on the very people who were killing him. And he saw their need for forgiveness. Now Jesus experienced all types of pain, from physical to emotional, all because of his great love and compassion for us. And he endured an excruciating death and separation from God the Father all on our behalf. Also that we could experience a personal relationship with our creator and spend eternity in his presence worshiping him. Now our current culture pushes away the idea of a God who is merciful and compassionate, but yet also judges and punishes evil. Where we live, we are pretty highly protected from true evil, although it did hit a bit closer to home uh, a few weeks ago with the events that happened in Gilroy. But the thing is, we have to revere all parts of God's character, both his mercy and his justice. Just as we saw in Exodus 34, All of that combined. God does punish sin, but he still accepts and forgives the sinner. That's good news. Jesus' death on the cross shows us how incredibly loving our God is because he sent his son to die for us, to take on our deserved punishment for our sin. Let's think back to Jonah again and this cycle. He heard the Lord and he ran. He was saved, he prayed, he was given a second chance. He heard from the Lord again and this time obeyed. Then he was angry because God did not destroy his enemy. Then a plant made him happy and then a plant made him sad. The Lord questioned his love for the plant, but his lack of compassion for an entire city. Jonah could not compare his need for grace, mercy, and compassion on the same level as the Ninevites' need for grace, mercy, and compassion. He was not motivated by God's call to mercy and to care for those who were lost. So I would ask, what motivates us? From the beginning of the human race, we have believed that the lie that our happiness needs to be our motivating factor. And that we know how to find this happiness better than God. We may live with this mindset that if we fully submit our lives to Christ as Lord, that we are going to miss out on some happiness that the world could bring. Or we think that we can find it on our own. But God knows better than we do. He does. And we are not promised a happy or an easy life. But you know what we are promised? We are promised peace, joy, strength, and comfort, even in life's hardest of circumstances. 
And I don't know about you, but I have seen God show up in incredible ways in my life when I felt like I shouldn't have strength or I shouldn't have joy, but God provides it. He's so faithful. And where does this all come from? It comes from our God. Things of this earth will only provide temporary happiness. And I would dare to argue that happiness does not even matter. Because you know what matters? Bringing God glory no matter what life throws our way. Happiness is circumstantial. Joy comes from the Lord. And joy is so much better than happiness. Happiness is fleeting, but the joy of the Lord is our strength, and it is constant. We have to choose to rely on the Lord for his joy and strength, and not on ourselves to find temporary happiness. We cannot just be hearers of God's word and truth, because just hearing God's word doesn't please God. What pleases God is our obedient response to his word. Saying yes to God brings us a new understanding of who he is and his character. It pushes us to growth. And our past mistakes and even our current mistakes do not disqualify us from being used by God. That is good news. Because we can never save or qualify ourselves. Salvation and qualification is found in Christ and Christ alone. We will never save ourselves. So what I want to ask you this morning is what is your Nineveh? What is God calling you to? But also, what is your plant What comfort are you choosing over God's call and reflecting his character to those who are lost? What is your Nineveh and what is your plant? And ultimately, what needs to be your yes? Last week, we looked at Jonah in comparison to the younger brother in the book of Luke. We have this reluctant prophet who is very similar to the younger brother where he wants to run from where he's supposed to be. And we talked about the parable of the prodigal son, but for most of us, we think the younger brother is the prodigal son, the lost son, but the truth is that in their parable, in that parable, there's two sons, and they're both lost. The elder brother is one that many who have grown up in the church or have been following Jesus for a while we can emulate, we can become this without even realizing it. It's subtle, and most of us don't even realize it. It comes from a misunderstanding of the gospel. I don't want you to miss that. It comes from the fact that most of us misunderstand the gospel. It comes from this idea that the gospel for an elder brother is more about what you can do for God rather than what he has done for you. And the elder brother cares more about earning salvation so he or she can have something on God when things don't go their way, and they can use their good works as a form of a bargaining chip with God. So Luke chapter 15, verse 25, we're jumping in the middle of this parable as Jesus is speaking to these Pharisees, and I love this contrast because the book of Jonah is historical, and many don't see it that way, and many see this parable, the prodigal son, as historical, even though it's not. It's a story that Jesus spoke. And he says this in the middle of the parable, verse 25, meanwhile, (laughs) the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. First off, that's a pretty awesome party if you can hear dancing, all right? (laughs) But we see the elder brother where? He's in the field. This signifies that he was working, that he was earning his keep, doing what he thinks he's supposed to as a son for his father. The younger brother has gone far off. He's, he's gone away. He's wasted his inheritance and come back in need with his tail between his legs. Enter the elder brother who didn't do any of that. He's just been working hard. But unfortunately, as we will see, not because of his father's affection, but to attempt to earn his place in the family and the benefits that he assumes come from that. 
Jonah had done what the Lord had told him to do. He had turned from his running. He had gone to Nineveh. He had done his duty by telling a people that he despised to repent, and guess what? God used it. How quickly do you and I forget that when we are obedient and God uses us, that we are just the hammer, not the carpenter. Any of us who are used by God are used for his glory, not our own. But how quickly do we forget when God uses us for something that makes much of him, and yet it's really, really easy to take the opportunity for the attention to be placed on us. All right, confession time. You guys ready? I'm going to start. I can't tell you how many times in the past decade really in the past two decades of ministry, that I have yearned for attention in my ministry, or I've been part of God doing something miraculous, bringing someone from death to life, and I wanted the praise to go to me, if I'm honest, rather than to him. As we've said before, when I make much of Jesus, people make much of me. And for most of my ministry, if I'm honest, that was not just a benefit, but part of my motivation, sadly. I admit that because I don't want anyone thinking that what we do here is about us. Those who are in leadership are servants. They are here to serve Christ Jesus, our Lord. And the hope is that, they, that you see Christ in us, not us in Christ. Do you know the difference? Because we will fail you. But if you see the work of Christ in us, you may just fall more in love with him. And by God's design and grace, we can know that we are a part of God drawing people to himself. For God's purpose to bring praise to his name. Verse 26. So he called one of the servants, this is the elder brother. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. This starts to enrage the brother, that this brother that he had had run away, but is back and now is having a party thrown for him. Jonah runs from where God wants him to go, but when he does finally do what the Lord tells him, he's angry that God actually leads a nation to repent through him. This is hilariously ironic. And Jonah hates that God decides in his grace. And here's the thing about grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. That's the definition He was angry with God that God decides in his grace to extend it to people that Jonah doesn't think deserve it. (laughs) That's the point. The elder brother didn't like how the father took the son back into the family because he felt entitled based on his good works. Please don't miss this. Entitlement is anti-grace. Entitlement is anti-gospel. Verse 28, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. Man, I'm having a tantrum at Target. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Do you see the father's heart in this moment? (laughs) He has this entitled, angry, ungracious son. And what does the father do? He goes to him. Isn't that the gospel? While we were still sinners, while we were still obstinate, while we were still entitled, while we were still blaspheming his name, Christ came to us and died in our place and rose from the dead. Hallelujah. Verse 29, but he, the elder brother, answered his father, look, I I picture him pointing, look, he grabbed the finger, just so you know, no, no, look. All these years, I've been slaving for you. I never disobeyed your orders, which if this was a real story, that's not true. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Jonah definitely wanted to use what he had done for the Lord as a bargaining chip with God to justify his desires. This is what the elder brother says to his father. He wants what he has done to justify him, and that is anti-gospel. And we can fall into the trap of thinking that what we do is necessary for God to love us and sustain us, and that because we've done what he said, he owes us because we've obeyed. We don't obey for God's affection. We obey because of God's affection. And it's not about being good, but being God's. Not we're gods, 
but being God's, that we are possessed by him. It's not good people that go to heaven. It's God's people that go to heaven. Rather than attempting to earn, we ought to rest in the grace that secures us as his. I was meeting with a bunch of guys this week, and we were talking about grace. And the thing that I want to constantly remind us of is that our identity, if we've come to Christ, is found securely in Jesus. So when the Father looks at you and all the stupid stuff that you or I did today and yesterday and will do tomorrow, he sees his son. Talk about good news. Not about being good, but being God's. Rather than attempting to earn, we ought to rest in the grace that secures us as his. Verse 30, but when this son of yours, the elder brother's still talking, but when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. The elder brother doesn't even refer to his brother as his brother. But instead he says, this son of yours. All right, let me be real. I do this too. Whenever my kids mess up, they're Aaron's kids. All right, just putting that out there. But the elder brother also wants to make known that what his brother has done is not something that he does. I hear over and over and over again from people, and again, I'm going to be honest, I do this as well, of accusations of someone who did this or that while I sit on my high horse because I don't do this or that. But yet I do so much more in so many other circumstances that exclude me from being holy. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5, Jesus is speaking the parable or the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, why do you look at the speck of the sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. (laughs) First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I have heard this passage for so long, and I've heard so many people misquote the verses that are right before these about judging. But what Jesus is saying is that if you attempt to only look at others' faults without acknowledging your own, you have no leg to stand on because you can't judge correctly. Verse 31, my son, the father said, possessive, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours elder brother, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So why do I say all of that? Because of the point of Jonah and the point of where we stand today, because being an elder brother isn't just about what you do, but the motive behind why you do what you do. And not understanding that, we can come and say, well, I did all the things. We can come to God and say, I went to church consistently. I did this. I did that. And we sound like the elder brother. So do you want to know if you're an elder brother? Do you want to know if you're a Pharisee or a legalist? I'm going to kind of quote my inner Jeff Foxworthy, but are you ready for this? Here are some statements to help you with understanding if you're an elder brother. Do you look to everyone else's faults without looking to your own first? or at all. You might be an elder brother. Do you think or act as if your obedience to the Lord has earned you some type of credit with God? You might be an elder brother. Do you judge how good a church service was based on how it made you feel? You might be an elder brother. Only the lead pastor gets to say that. Do you read your Bible to justify yourself in the company of other Christians? You might be an elder brother. Do you justify your spiritual walk as good based on comparing yourself to others? You might be an elder brother. Do you not stand during a worship song because it's new and not about you? Woo! You might be an elder brother. If you give your treasure, your talents, or your time to the church in expectation of getting to call the shots, you might be an elder brother. If you feel entitled to a bigger role in the kingdom or even in the church, you might be an elder brother. Is the gospel more about what you get out of it than what God gave up for you? You might be an elder brother. Is your Christianity more about what others see you do than what you do in secret? You are an elder brother. 
Do you wish that everyone knew God like you or had your theology? You might be an elder brother. Do you point to some past accomplishment as your righteousness rather than what God has done for you in the past, the present, and the future? You might be an elder brother, but hear me, church. There's some good news. And hopefully you hear this the rest of your life, and I pray that it doesn't harden your heart because you just ignore it. Hear me. God doesn't save you because you did anything to earn it or because of some potential you might have in the future to help him. God saves you. Are you ready? Are you ready? God saves you because, wait, listen in, because he loves you. And he gave you the faith to trust him at his word. And there is not a thing about your salvation you can take credit for. Because salvation belongs to God and he gives it as however he pleases. So did the Ninevites deserve a prophet to come and tell them to repent? No way, they were terrible. Did Jonah deserve a fish to be swallowed up by to give him the opportunity to reflect and repent? Not at all. Did you deserve to hear about the gospel the way you did when the Lord opened your eyes to the marvelous mystery and beauty of he who knew no sin because sin, uh, did he, did you deserve the gospel to understand it? Did you deserve to have your eyes open to it? No, not at all. Did Jesus deserve to hang on a cross and die for your sin? Nope. It was completely unfair as we humanly see fairness, but I'll let you in on a secret. My God isn't fair, he's just. And I know this because for some reason I am redeemed by his grace when I didn't do anything to earn it or attain it. The most beautiful gift ever given in the person and work of Jesus Christ, I didn't do anything for that. So let me end with this. We've concluded this book of Jonah a book that is rarely taught in big church, if you will, because many see it as allegory rather than history. But we taught it so you could know a few things. That God is gracious. That God loves you. That God is a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. And that there was a better Jonah who never ran from God's commands but lived the life that you couldn't, died the death that you and I should have, and physically rose from the dead, defeating what sin had produced, which is death, so that you and I could live. You notice at the end of the book, Jonah kind of leaves us hanging. It doesn't tell us what happens to Jonah. It ends with him and God in this pretty heated discussion and God questioning Jonah and his anger. Here is my stance, and it's speculation, but it's based on logic. What happened to Jonah? Here's my stance. I'd say that Jonah ended up redeemed, okay? I believe Jonah ended up saved, sealed, and delivered, cue Stevie Wonder, by God, not because of how good he was, because obviously he wasn't very good. He was a racist bigot who disobeyed God numerous times. So why would I think that God redeemed him? Because it's not about what he did. It was about whose he, he was. Because the story of Ju- Jonah is one that you and I know. So don't miss this. One that the Holy Spirit was involved in and penned using a human tool to document this actual life and events of Jonah. If Jonah had never truly repented, I don't think he'd ever tell or maybe even write this story because he is definitely not the hero. You guys notice that? And unredeemed people rarely, if ever, tell stories where they can't be seen in a good light somehow. Think about it. But we know this story. We've studied this story. And I believe it's because God drew Jonah to himself. And Jonah could tell others what happened. Even though Jonah looks terrible from beginning to end of these four chapters of Scripture, because he isn't the hero, God is the hero, and he always will be, and Jonah was happy to let others know. And if God can save Jonah, he can save anyone. But unlike Jonah and the elder brother, 
the fact that he can save anyone, that ought to bring us joy. Not resentment, not anger, because God, who was gracious with Jonah and the father in the parable of the prodigal sons, went to the elder brother, and Jesus Christ came to the earth that rejected him so you and I could be made right before God. So I want you to remember one thing when it comes to this book, not just that he wasn't swallowed by a whale, all right? I want you to remember one thing. Jesus is the better Jonah. 